Welcome to the Williamsville Public Library and Museum. Today is September 8, 2023. We're talking to JR and Sharon Fawns about their reflections on Williamsville. Obviously, things have changed a lot in your time here in Williamsville. What do you miss the most when you think about how things have changed? The one thing, well, the economy, basically. That everything has changed so much with the economy that I kind of worry about it. My age, I probably shouldn't, but it still does bother me about what's going to finally happen. But anyway, is, is that all right? To stay? Of course, of course. So do you, you ran small businesses. Your family's been in the small business arena for decades. How do you think the economy economy has changed in, from a small business perspective or affecting small businesses or family-owned businesses? Well, it's so different. And because I've been out of it for 30 years, I guess you have to be involved in it more to, to really know the right answer there. That's okay. I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer, yeah. but obviously you're right. Mm -hmm. The economy has changed a ton. Also, when you think back, we're part of the library and museum, so we try to preserve local history, and we appreciate you being here to help us with this local history project. What parts of history, especially local history, do you really want to see preserved or protected? Well, I probably said this in the interview, but the big thing to me is being involved in Route 66. And when we were asked if it would be all right if your family would be inducted to the Hall of Fame, Route mm -hmm. 66 Hall of Fame, it didn't take me long to answer that one. That There's probably a lot of people that's involved as deep as we were, but can't be too many for that many years. But anyway, that's probably the big part, being asked. And the night that that happened, I don't know, there was maybe a couple of other families that were getting involved in Route 66. And the story I told you was the story I told them that night about the TV and property mm -hmm. of Dreamland Motel. Sure. I wondered about that when they asked me, Mr. Fawns, that night you'll be asked to say something. And I said, well, I'm not very good at that. I, but I had a nephew who was still running a standard station in Sherman on Old Route 66 and Patrick. And I knew he was going to be there as well as most of the family. And I asked him if he'd do that. And he, no, I won't. I'm going to be there. But no, no, I'm not. I can't do that either. So that's when the story came up. And as I look back, on that, the people that were there that night, audience people, really had a big kick out of that story, but that was just one of many that I had right. in those 40 years. Natalie, back to that, it was really Josh Fredericks that really got us into the Hall of Fame. He came to our house several times, and we told him a lot of stories, and when he presented that to the a Pontiac, uh, they agreed that the Fonses, and not only did they run the service station, you know, his mother run a restaurant for quite a few years on Route 66. Anyhow, I think they well deserve to be in there. And the night they were inducted, there was at least probably 37 of the Fonses there. And now, when I got the book ready for the library, I counted, and there are 79 Fonses. And a lot of them never left Williamsville. And right? my mother and father are totally responsible for that. <laughs> Now, going back to your mom, what was the name of the restaurant that she ran? On 66, 66 Cafe. Cafe. All right. Okay. And the other person, and I don't know if this has been uh, brought to light or not, but his brother George and his brother-in-law, Harold B. Long, were the ones that started the garbage pickup, Lakeside, Lake Area. Lake area. Lake area? Mm -hmm. And they ran an old state truck. They bought an old state truck and made it into a garbage truck. Okay. And they did it for several years, really. Mm -hmm. And that lakes area garbage is what the Long's garbage was. So your family in many ways has been involved in the service through, right. it seems like, whatever businesses That's they've right. chosen. Um, and of course, in terms of the service business with the, the service stations that started with your dad, and I'm just going to assume that he was one of the important people that inspired you. What kinds of things about the way he was or the way he did business really drove you as a business person or inspired you as a business My person? My father? Yes. Well, I, I think I mentioned earlier 
the one thing probably is honesty, and I still believe that. I, I, I look back on, and Dad was pretty much the way I continued. He gave a lot of people a lot of things that they couldn't afford, something that we had and they couldn't take care of, but he did that, and I think that plays into my uh, lifetime, too. So do you think carrying on that tradition is something that you're proud of? Yes. So when you think about that, what do you want your family and your community to think of when they think of the Fawns family? Hardworking, honest. His dad was a very quiet man. He hardly ever had much to say, but when he did, you better listen. And what about you specifically, Jr.? What do you want people to say about you or think about you? I look back and I think serving in Korea started, I was so happy that I got through that and there were a lot of them, a lot worse than I had it, but I think I had it pretty tough too. And because I made it, had a heart attack, and I made it, and He's come here. April, I'm going to be 92 years old. So something worked, and I'm thankful for that. You've gathered a little bit of wisdom over the years. Is there anything you'd like to share when you think about the next generation, younger people? advice or insight? Oh gosh, I... I wish they'd lay their phones down. <laughs> when we live, we've lived on Main Street now for most of our life, and when those kids go by with their cell phones on their bicycles, I think. Dangerous. Oh yeah, and they're missing. Well, they're a big bike. help, but they also can be a problem, and uh, I don't know, but I think she's right. I think, um, they spend too much time. As a matter of fact, once this got real heavy in, in those phones, a young boy, probably 11 or 12 years old, was riding his bicycle by our house. And he had one hand holding the phone and one hand on the handlebar. And he ran off and hit a tree. And it didn't hurt him that bad. Broke his finger. Broke his finger. But that began this feeling. Right. Uh, and it's gotten worse. I mean, it's just, yeah. well, everybody knows that. It's so aside from being dangerous, what do you think they're missing out on? by being so attached to their phones. Oh, they're missing out on being friends face to face, and it's just a shame. And Natalie, I want to throw this in there. Um, I counted when we lived on Harpo. We lived at the corner of Harpo and Vine in the little yellow house. We built that new when we got married. And across the street was the Finley family, and there were seven of them. And I counted from Harpo and Vine up to Bill Turner's corner. They had seven kids, and all along there, there were big families, and I counted 59 kids. Wow. And you don't see that anymore. They have one or two, and that's fine. But anyhow, big families are over with mostly. And, right. And uh, we love kids. And we... You have been a great person for this job, and I understand you're going to have control of the library, and I'm thankful for that. You've done a super job. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Getting back to you as we're wrapping this up, is there anything we haven't talked about or anything else that you'd like to say about Williamsville? I would like to Either tell one. a story about a doctor in town. Okay, it was Dr. Stubble. And, uh, well, when after he started doctoring and we went to Cokie Mill and all them fancy things, and I said <laughs> to him, can you believe we lived in the time of Dr. Stubble? And I had an old lady friend where Sheila Caldwell lives now. Her name was Julia Bennett. A lot of people knew Julia. She was alone. She had no family. She and I became very close. And she had a, what she thought was a gallbladder attack. So anyhow, she sent me up to Doc Stuttles to tell him what the problem was. She didn't go, but I had to explain. He gave her some little purple pills and they helped her. So when Doc Stuttle was retiring, Julia said, Sharon, I want you to go and buy every pill that he had. So, okay, I, I was a good friend of Mrs. Stuttle, so I knew them and they knew me. So I knocked on the door. Doctor came and I told him what I was there for. So we set up a card table, if you can believe this. I sat on one side, he sat on the other. We counted out the purple pills. She bought every one, and they were like two or three cents a piece. Can you imagine <laughs> what a doctor would do now? I'll always remember that. Definitely things have changed a little bit. Oh, yeah. And you know, they, he would come to the house and 
take care of you. I was Dr. Stubble. Oh yeah, tell that story about he would have to have a, a driver's test and he would all I don't know back then, now I think at eighty five or so you have to have it every year. And I've had it for several. But anyway, he had to have a driver's test ever all. And before he did, if it was gonna be on Monday, he'd come like Friday and have me go through all the questions because he had to get a written exam too, I guess. I can remember when he would leave my house and go back to the office, that would have been the old Route 66. He had to cross the northbound traffic to go south. And there, I could tell when he got to that intersection because all the horns were honking. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I could hear wheels skidding when it took the first one. But I don't know how old he was, but he still got his driver's license. But you're not going to pull any tricks like that, right? No. <laughs> and All again, right. thank you. Well, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your memories and all your reflections and a little bit of insight and advice. Tell us a little extra well, story. Well, Sharon had mentioned in this interview that we built a little house. See, we were married three years, I guess. We rented and then finally was able to borrow enough money to build a house. And not long after we were there, Lee Miller built across the road. There used to be a, an old building over there called the skating rink. And the state used to put their trucks in there. And of course, they'd wake us up at midnight at night when they'd come and go in that state truck when there's a snow on them. But anyway, Lee built a home right there. Because it's across the alley. Yeah, across the alley. And Sharon and Lee's wife became very close friends. Well, anyhow, uh, Janet, Lee's wife, was expecting a baby. And so Lee says he don't remember them, but we do. He <laughs> asked Junior, if I'm not around, will you take Janet to the hospital? And so the, he agreed, but Lee got home in time, and they had a beautiful baby girl, Tara, right? Yeah, Tara. Yeah, Tara. And uh, that was in 1965, and Janet was following me around. I was heading up homecoming, mm -hmm. and I was walking all over, and she was chasing me around, going with me. And that, that night, she had, I had to take her to the hospital. So I remember that July 3rd, mm -hmm. 1965. Five. And I had a new baby girl. Uh -huh. Well, Janet and I became good friends, and her mother and brother would come over from Mount Sterling, and they would always come over and visit, and uh, we had quite a friend. I can remember talking about the Miller family. I can remember his dad and his younger brother would come to the station with a couple of big cans so, and fill them up with water to take home. Why? I thought we laughed when we tell him that if he had got the water today, I would have to charge him. <laughs> <laughs> but why were they coming to the station for jugs of water? Well, the well no, he was, was a customer, bad. but yeah, the well okay. would have been bad. Yeah, the well. And then, okay. Of course, he asked me if he could get the water, and back then, sure. But right. today I'd ask, well, I'd have to charge you a little bit. <laughs> right. Another story, Natalie, I think is interesting. When we wanted to move to Williamsville, we had lived in Springfield. And so this lot that we're talking about there on the corner, Bob Maxwell, it would be Eva. Dorothy comes in. Her sister Eva was married to Bob. And the dad was real sick. And so Bob said, why don't you go talk to my dad? Maybe he'll sell you that lot. So he did, and Mr. Maxwell agreed that he would sell the lot for $800. Wow. Can you imagine? And so wow. we bought the lot, and we still didn't have any money, but we went. he went to the bank, and they would only loan us $5,000. The house was going to cost ten, so we started charging things. We went to Abbott Brothers and charged the lumber, and we got the house. So nice. It was a uh, uh, kind of a. She hard said time. she worked at Producers Dairy, and she said, "Do you remember when a payment was due at the bank? You'd give me a call to make sure that." Well, what we did was there was a credit union at the bank, and I borrowed the eight hundred dollars to buy the lot. Mm. And every week they would take twenty-five dollars out of my pay, right. which was only thirty-five to begin with. Wow! But we got it all paid for, so nice. we started and she from keeps scratch. reminding me. You remember the eight hundred dollars we paid? She said, "When you sell this property, I want my eight hundred dollars back." <laughs> well, it's only fair, right, Sharon? Right. It's only mm -hmm. fair. Well. Well, thank you again. Yeah.